I'm Harry Levine, and uh, <laughs> I've been uh, studying police in New York, uh, interviewing cops, uh, and working with the National Black Police Association, so not just cops in New York, about marijuana arrests in particular. Uh, and a couple of things useful to know is that 90% of arrests are males. Um, so women are in a, in a se serious advantage, and they should exploit it. <laughs> Absolutely, they should exploit it. Um, and things that will work for women won't necessarily work for men. Uh, the, um, the question of what ordinary people can do is if you come by in a counter, if one, somebody comes by in a counter, um, and the, not even intervening, but just standing 10 or 12 or 15 feet away and watching. Uh, and New Yorkers will do this sometimes. Uh, New Yorkers will, will, will just do it, but people can, should be encouraged to do that. Uh, not to get involved uh, and to be a possible witness if something should happen, if somebody should need one. The, a police officer told me about a case, it was an actual case in New York, in which there were several kids in a car and, and they got stopped and one of them had a small MP3 player that had a microphone on it and clicked on the microphone and recorded the whole encounter. And the whole case, and it got actually written up a little bit. Um, so these MP3 players could also be used discreetly in some <coughs> cases, particularly if you have more than one person involved. And, um, and, then, and then the, the, uh, the, the uh, Stephen and I have talked about this a little bit, but the situation with ID in New York is really bad. And police will bring people to the station if they don't have any ID on them. And on the grounds that they might be a serial killer from out of state, and therefore, even though you know, they speak with a thick New York accent and have probably never left the Bronx, nonetheless, they might be a serial killer from you know, <coughs> Utah, and therefore, they have to bring them in. And they then use that as an excuse to put people's fingerprints and, and photographs and ID into the system never to be retrieved again. So, um, and, and in fact, the cops will take often nothing but a driver's license or it's equivalent. So they're actually hauling all kinds of teenage kids in, over, overwhelmingly black and Latino, 89% or so black and Latino. I mean, that's a real number, um, just um, for having no ID on them. So it's as bad as, uh, as we can imagine. And, and bravo, bravo, guys. Uh, thank you for the film. I think uh, it's going to be very educational for the work that we do. We're, we're organizing parents and students. and. Uh, in Los Angeles, one of the things that um, I guess a question for y'all is how much how much is a broken windows policing impacting the Constitution? For example, we're organizing around decriminalizing truancy because tr that means students could be stopped for being late to school and searched and given a two hundred fifty dollar ticket for coming late or, or or playing hooky. So the question is how how bad is Broken windows really, uh, uh, really uh, un undoing the Constitution in that way. Um, well, the broken windows theory is uh, the social scientist James Q. Wilson, you know, positive theory that if you, you know, if you focus on petty offenses, um, it will help, you know, lower crime rates because it creates a, a better, you know, in, you know, environment. Um, and the place where, you know, that definitely has. They put that into effect, you know, more so than just where anywhere, anywhere, anywhere else is New York City, um, where they have about forty thousand uh, marijuana arrests a year, and about um, I think about a million. They're searching, you know, patting down about a, I could be wrong, about a million people in order to do this. So they're casting a really wide net. So New York City really is, sort of, uh, I hate to say, ground zero for for the, this sort of uh, uh, policing. I wanted to add just sort of one. More quick thought to that, because I think your question essentially, you know, how much does this type of petty policing all over the country undermine constitutional rights generally? I think it's sort of that question for me that's sort of central to all of the work that we do. The biggest challenge that I run into is the defeated people that come to us and say, what is the point of the work that you're doing? Why are you telling me about my right to refuse searches when I know that they're going to search me anyway? What is, what is the point of all of this? 
You know, and like I, I mentioned before, with regards to filing complaints, it's about extremes. If everyone asserts their rights, we're going to get better results than if no one does. And the harder we push this, the more awareness that there is, especially in the age of video and all of these other resources. That's what it's all about. But the point is that we run into this every day is people who don't even understand their rights because they don't think that there's any reason to bother even acquiring that knowledge. You know, if, if we're that defeated that we're not even we don't even realize what we don't know. And so that's sort of the uh, part of the idea here, that we take this information even to folks in, in cities like LA and New York and in places where the worst possible policing practices are taking place. Awareness of those tactics, of the illegality, of tactics that are even routinely tolerated in the courts, over time, hopefully, will serve to erode them. And a population that understands these rights is empowered to defend them in all sorts of venues where that's currently not always taking place the way that it should. So. That's really our overall goal, is to change that nexus.